Hi, everybody. Welcome to Tips and Tricks Tuesdays. I'm your host, host, teacher, Valentina V. I am a filmmaker in Los Angeles. I direct, I do cinematography, I edit. I like to consider myself a Swiss army knife of things. Um, it's also good for producers because I do everything myself. And on this show, what I love doing is interviewing cool creative people in the industry, as well as teaching you tips and tricks in different Adobe programs. Today, we are talking After Effects, and this is one of the newer, I would say, processes in After Effects. It's come out in the last two, three years, which is how to use After Effects to create motion graphics templates that you can then use in Premiere Pro. If you can see me, if you can hear me, please just give me a little heart in the chat room, whether it's a red heart, a purple heart, a blue heart, it doesn't matter because I'm reading your replies right here. If you have any questions for me or my guest today, leave them in the chat room too. I also want to remind you that we do have a 45 minute lesson after the chat and you can get the manual right here at this website, adobe.ly slash tips Tuesday. So not only can you follow along with all of the notes that I have prepared for you, and it took me a really long time to make the notes. So I hope you do go here and you download them and you follow along, but you can also enter for a chance to win 12 months of Creative Cloud for free, which is an amazing value. And you should really just like jump on that. Last week's winner is Andrew Feinberg. So congratulations, Andrew. You have won 12 months of Creative Cloud. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce my special guest for the day. His name is Daniel Hashimoto. He goes by Hashi, but you may know him as Action Movie Kid. Daniel, hello and welcome. Oh, no. He dropped out of the program. That's always fun. So he's going to come back, but, uh, you know, live streaming, we're doing it live. So that's how it goes sometimes. But while uh, we get him back onto the stream, let's go take a look at his YouTube channel. So um, Daniel does all kinds of fun stuff. Oh, hold on. My computer setup is also glitching out. So give me a second to switch this up and uh, troubleshoot for just a sec. Let's see here. I want the monitor. I want this one. Yes, there we go. Aha, she is doing it live. There we go. So here is the Action Movie Kids YouTube channel. What's great is that there are so many different compilations that I could show you here as well. So let's go to the compilation from just, you know, one year ago, the best of Action Movie Kids, and take a look at that. So I feel like it's a little bit self-explanatory. So what um, what Daniel does is he plays with his kids in different environments, and then he will just create these fantastical scenes in his home of them playing around, of them uh, jumping through lava or breaking through walls or being in the grocery store and activating a lightsaber. Daniel's worked at DreamWorks. He is a professional motion graphics artist. But uh, this is something that he likes to do for fun with his kids. So I'm excited to talk to him if and when he comes back online. There's always issues when you're live streaming, especially if you're live streaming from Los Angeles, because we have been having issues and blackouts constantly. So I totally get it. But once we get him back, it'll be all good. Um in the chat room, I would like to know what are some things that you have been working on lately and what is your experience with After Effects? This tutorial is meant to be for both those people who have used After Effects before and may not know this particular process that I'm about to show you of how to create motion graphics. 
and it is for people who maybe are completely new to After Effects, that's okay. You'll just learn this one specific process and then you will go on from there. He's commenting in the chat room that he's attempting to reconnect. He's waiting to join. Just one sec. Let's see. There we go. And welcome, Hashi. Hey, hey. you made it. Yeah. I like to add suspense when I can. So. You know, I you, you're late, but you are uh, appreciated. And you know what? It's fashionable to be late. So you're you're Miranda Priestly, essentially, <laughs> is what I'm saying. How are you today? Doing very well. How are you doing, Valentina? I'm doing excellent. Um, I'm very excited because finally I am getting back to what I love to do, which is uh, create new stuff with new people and meet new people as well. So you're actually someone that I've been aware of since 2014, I believe. Not I've, I've been watching clips. I've been seeing your clips pop up. I think I know your son's face extremely well at this point because I've seen <laughs> all of the videos. Um, but... Uh, for those people who don't know, what is your kind of process through shooting and editing these videos? Do you like have ideas? Do you have like a list of ideas you go through or has it evolved over time? It's definitely evolved over time. It's kind of this mixed bag of things. Um, originally, they just started as videos of me filming like my kid enjoying a game that he was playing in the living room or something like that. And usually my wife would realize some game that he was playing and she would call me in and say like, he's playing the floor is lava in here. It's really cute. And so we would film those and share them with friends or family. And um, when I started doing it, it was just because we wanted to differentiate our home videos from the other home videos we were seeing on Facebook and things like that. So I decided to make it look like we were constantly putting our child in danger uh, just to troll people a little bit, at least my Facebook friends. Um, and uh, my parents were not on Facebook. And so we ended up just figuring out like, well, we'll send them. They didn't have smartphones or anything. So we just sent them YouTube links in via email. And that was the easiest way that we could use YouTube as a container to send them video files. And uh, we did that for a while just because it was a hobby and it, was, it came out of my visual effects background. It was fun to do. And um, so you never intended yeah. for it to blow up in any way. You were just sending the links to your parents. Exactly. So at first, like you had videos, they were getting like what, like 20 views, 30 views. What oh, was yeah. what like, was like was, that first time? Yeah. So like the first two, I mean, it happened incredibly quickly, but it was... Like for two months, I had posted like 10 videos on there. I'd sent them to my parents. They were getting, you know, they were watching them. They were sending them to aunts and uncles and things like that. And then um, one day, out of nowhere, people started calling me at work. My coworkers at work were saying like, hey, dude, you're on Reddit. And so I went to check that out. And someone had made a GIF of um, James jumping into a puddle of water and disappearing. And that got shared a bunch and made it to the front page of Reddit. The Reddit -y sleuths found out where it came from and posted my website. And suddenly in one day, these two months worth of videos got a million views, which was absurd. And so, uh, yeah. I mean, here's the thing, though. It's not like the first video popped off. A lot of people think when they're on YouTube, they have to make uh, their first video have a million views or else they're not going to do it anymore or they get really discouraged. Mm -hmm. But for you, it wasn't the views that were fueling you that were, were driving you to create just the fact that you wanted to do it. So you were putting all these videos up. So by the time that that Reddit bump happened, oh, hold on, the stream has gone down. Always fun when the stream goes down. Let me wait for it to come back. Okay, it's back now. So when you were when you had that Reddit bump, when people found you on Reddit, um, you already had a bunch of videos on your channel. So it wasn't like, oh, they were coming in and you had just had one video. They like marathoned your videos and they were like, oh, this is a consistent theme. Let's mm. subscribe. Right? Yeah, I think that was the that was the luckiest part about it was that it uh, that yeah we had a little like 
bank of things that people could watch when they came. And so it kept them bouncing around the channel and encouraged people to subscribe. So I'm really glad that I hadn't tried, like, you know, put in work to try to launch something and hoped really badly that the first one would go well because they, they didn't. They, they sat there for months without anyone seeing them. And it was just nice that, uh, yeah, exactly like you said. Well, okay, so Shanti in the chat room um, asks, as an FX noob, your videos are amazing. What's the time that it takes uh, to do your clips on average? Because it feels daunting to see professionals work. Well, Sean, we're, we weren't, we didn't all start out as professionals. It takes years and years and years, first of all. But um, yeah, so what, what would you say to Sean's question? How long does it take you to do an average video? Sure, thanks, Sean. It takes about, for especially for the first batch of action movie kid videos, which were usually kind of a 10 second long gag, like basically visual gag. Those would usually take me between six and eight hours to do at the end of the day. I would stay up late to finish them or doing them. Some were as easy as adding in lightsabers and explosion effects on top of things. And a lot of the work is camera tracking and masking out characters to kind of preserve the home video look of everything. I tried really distinctly to not make any of them look cinematic to begin with. I left the auto exposure on on the camera. They're always handheld. I'm moving around and they're fairly long takes. And a lot of those things make for very complicated VFX shots. But like Valentina mentioned, I'm building on something that I'd been doing for years, 15 or 16 years before that, before getting to that point, playing with the visual effects, playing with um, After Effects specifically and learning how to do those types of things. But what's nice is that practice makes anything a lot easier. And so I only bit off videos that I figured I could fit into my already full-time job kind of space. But yeah, back to the answer, six to eight hours for the original videos. And now whenever we've tried to bite off bigger challenges, we find them much more difficult to do. <laughs> What I like about your videos is most of the time it starts as a regular video or you you kind of pan to like you pan to the lava mm -hmm. or you're in the store and the lightsaber's not on yet, right? So it it looks like a regular home video and then you add that element of surprise and that kind of kind of elevates the fact that oh hey, no, he's using like real footage. This is like real shaky auto exposure stuff. And then you have to use uh, a bunch of tricks to like match the exposure of the effect with the exposure of the video, track it through that, you know, that takes time to learn, but through your work, um, you've learned it. So it looks seamless. Good sure. job. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. I think that the, the organic nature of them does make them a lot more relatable and people kind of have a, have an idea of what home videos are like they're you know the that they're handheld and they're they're focusing on their child who they're trying to capture through this thing and one of the most important parts of us starting the process um my wife would usually be the one my wife mandy would let me know what the kids were doing and recognize something that was unique that they really liked like they were playing a a game where they're pretending a shark is trying to eat them and it's really Mandy running around with an oven mitt trying to chomp at them on the couch. And suddenly that gets spun into this whole uh, short where James is running away from Jaws. And what was fun about doing those time, what they were trying to accomplish or what the video was supposed to look like, we were just, just like other parents trying to capture our kids having a fun time playing a game. And hopefully all of that makes its way into the overall like magic or fun of watching the videos is that it's really a kid doing something that just one clip, but like that you're posting on Twitter or that you're, it started with one clip back in the day when you started your channel, but now it's like a full on story with close ups and wides and like these days. <laughs> um, okay. Now it is almost back. It is back. So my question is, do your kids have fun with this? Do they pick? It was neat because they were so small. They didn't even have a sense of what visual effects were. They also weren't exposed to much media. So if they were shown a video of themselves blowing up something, my son would say, like, did I do that? I don't remember. 
Yeah. And, um, but over time they've come to learn that yes, dad is going to film them and something else is going to appear. And from that, they've evolved into some interesting little beings because they have that childlike imagination where they love to play, pretend, or imagine something else is in the room just by their nature, which is great. And it's led them to understanding, wait, if dad films it and we tell him what to do, maybe he can make it a video that we can now watch and enjoy. So they've started slowly evolving into collaborators where Sophia will say things like, I'm going to blow the bubbles. And then when I blow the bubbles, you delete me. So I'm gone. And it's amazing to hear them sort of understand these mild visual effect things that have to happen, or they both understand it's second nature to them for dad to sort of hold still and say, okay, clear frame. And they'll, you know, they'll run out so I can continue the camera action past a certain point to like Zach King stitch something together. But um, it's really great because Originally, I was imposing a lot of my own sensibilities on them and putting my son in Star Wars or Indiana Jones because that's what I grew up loving. And nowadays, they will watch and enjoy movies in that same way that we got to enjoy them in the 80s or early 90s growing up and loving things. And so they'll say, like, we really love The Descendants on Disney, the Disney Channel, or we really like Phineas and Ferb and these new things that I'm not used to, but they understand that they can be a part of that creative world through visual effects. The older they get, the more they're going to start taking advantage of that, you know, for school projects, for whatever, they're going to be like, oh yeah, my dad can build a virtual world. It's no problem. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Yesterday, um, Sophia and James brought the clapper a little, we have a little clapper board over and had written like scene one, take one, dad feeds the kids ice cream. And like, okay, dad, you're the cameraman and you've got to feed us <laughs> ice cream. Oh my and, goodness. Yeah, they know if it's for a shoot, it's going to happen. So, uh. um, so what are some things that if people are doing VFX or motion graphics or anything, what are some rules of thumb that you would say are crucial to make graphics feel like they live in the world and this could be with special effects like what you're doing with um putting objects in but it could also be with just like text that appears on screen or or graphics that appear on screen not necessarily anything that's like super hardcore vfx sure well it's interesting because they both have similar principles in a way um with visual effects, even though sometimes the point is to really stand out and make a big moment out of them, with titles or graphics and design, um, both of them to fit into a video need to somehow stylistically match in a way. When I'm doing mm. visual effects, I'm trying to follow the rules of our physical world as opposed to an action movie world where you know things will fly an extra distance or anything. I like to be messy and organic and have things be dirty and not work out the way you would think if they were in a movie or at least have the movie action set off a series of real world events where, you know, the house is destroyed afterward. And with tiles or something like that, I think that there are ways that you can make things really stand out and go against the grit of a video. And that can be great. That can be too much. Um, so I love the idea of, trying to make things feel more organic and soft and subtle and slide in where they can so people don't notice them or they feel like a natural part of them. So with titles and things coming in, I would do things like remembering to add in either ease keyframes or bouncing something in. And so it gives itself a little bit of attention when it comes in, but is not loud enough that it overtakes whatever else you're trying to show off. Yeah, so that when it comes in from point A to point B, it's not just like a steady velocity. It kind of like, doom, like bounces mm -hmm. into place. That's also a very natural thing to do. How about color wise? Do you tend to match colors? This is something that I like posting in the chat room. Okay, the stream is back, should be back. So the question is, how... So it's also on like a 30 second delay with the YouTube. So I'm just like... <laughs> Is it back? Is it not? <laughs> if you can see us, if you can hear us, uh, please just give us, uh, say the word lava in the chat room. Just say the word lava 
if you can see us and you can hear us and then I'll know my my last question this will be my last question is about color so mm-hmm. how can people use color to integrate their visual effects with the existing footage sure well color is an interesting one for me I am colorblind red and green look the same to me and so I have a very bizarre profession to have chosen where I'm focusing on color a lot. So I count very much on the color picker to know that I am, if I'm gonna color something, I'm sampling a color directly from my footage so I know that it matches when it's a visual effect. And if it's a title, I definitely thematically might think of an overall color for a project, but certainly want to try to sample it from footage that is going into that project. And the color picker is one of my best friends. The infographic at the top telling me the color mix or the- This is- So fun. Never happened uh, this (laughs) frequently before. And we are almost back. We are, nope, we're off again. Um, That's okay, that's all right. We're gonna get through it tonight, but it's the morning. Um, Okay, we're back. So we were just talking about the color picker that is one of the best effects, uh, or that is one of the best tricks available. And also because Hashi is colorblind, using the um, HSI values, knowing where the colors are on the color wheel is also very helpful. Just memorizing where the colors are on the color wheel. Personally, I do not trust any monitor or my eyes when I'm color grading. So I use scopes, I use a uh, false color. I'll use histograms. I use any type of assisting tools that are available just to make mm-hmm. sure that the colors match. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, like I'm wearing my Enchroma glasses that are supposed to enhance me seeing a difference between red and green, which is a little helpful for monitors and stuff. But yeah. Well, they look really cool. Um, thank you for being here. If people want to check out your work, which I'm sure they do, because I've been showing it throughout this presentation, presentation, interview, who do I think I am? Um, where can they uh, Where can they check it out? Um, you can definitely see all of our stuff collected together on YouTube at Action Movie Kids. And if you're interested in visual effects on a day-to-day basis, you can follow me on Twitter at Action Movie Kid where I post all the time little behind the scenes or tips and tricks and things like that and generally get into the nitty gritty of the BTS stuff. Yeah, Twitter is where we both live. Twitter is where our friendship began. So Twitter is a great website. I love it so much. So more memes, more chats. Uh, but for now, I have to say goodbye because I have a lesson to teach. So I'm looking forward to that lesson. I don't know how to do what you're about to teach. So I'm going to check it out. Oh, my God. Well, No pressure. (laughs) All right. Bye, Hashi. Thanks, everyone. All right. So let me set this up. I would really like to thank you for sticking through all the technical difficulties. Um, The issue is that, you know, it's Los Angeles internet, and we've been having just every apocalyptic problem that you could possibly imagine. So let me go ahead and open this up. But before I do, I do want to remind you that the workbook for today's lesson is available at bit.ly slash tips Tuesday, which is also where you can us and it'll be pages and pages. It's a 11 page workbook and it's everything that I'm about to teach you all step by step laid out with photos. These workbooks take me new composition. We're going to make a transition effect that we can then uh, put onto any type of footage in Premiere, use the color picker effect to choose different colors for that transition. So the first thing we are here in After Effects, we are going to create a new composition. So we go to c- composition, new composition, name it something. So I'm going to name it um, try line transition and make sure that the width is 1920 by 1080, that the pixel aspect ratio is square pixels, the frame rate is 23.976, all Gucci. We'll keep the background color black. That is just for us to be able to see it, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, well, it doesn't mean that the background color is black. The background color is actually transparent. And my drawing tool has decided to say goodbye, so, I'm going to have to restart it so I can draw on the screen. Just give me a quick sec to restart it. Okie dokie, let's do that. And let's restart it so that I can get it back up. 
<clears throat> it loves to malfunction. There we go. Here it is. Okay, so next we want to create a couple of shapes, but we're going to create one shape first and then we're just going to duplicate it because we're lazy. So we're going to create what is a rounded rectangle. And the fun thing about rounded rectangles is we have the tool for that already. So up here, the rectangle tool, if you hold it down, you'll be able to add a rounded rectangle. So you go ahead and select that and make a rounded rectangle. It'll look like this at first. Whatever the default color, line stroke, everything is, that is okay. We can deal. If we go here to the rectangle effects or the rectangle properties, we can come here and we can see all of the different properties. So for example, stroke, right now it's a white stroke and has a stroke width. I'm going to change that stroke width to zero because I don't want a stroke. So now it's just no stroke here. And let me turn my taskbar off so you can see it a little bit better. Everything is moving. Okay. And then last but not least, this is kind of a very, you know, it's, it's not quite the half circle that I was going for here. So I will go to the, um, I will go to the trans the do, 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 rectangle path controls and here under roundness roundness is currently at 20 so i will increase the roundness until i get that nice uh half circle on the ends and then i can always go back to my selection tool i can stretch it out a little bit or i can go to the scale tool and scale just one of the the properties at once but i want my line to kind of cover up a third of the screen because I only want three lines on here. So it covers up a third of the screen. Let me zoom out a little bit, make it cover up all of the screen. There we go. Let's see, give it a little bit more, make it a little bit bigger. And just, you know, play with it a little bit so that it covers the, the whole screen. There we go. So that is going to be where my, my object, my uh, rectangle ends up. But I want it to start off screen. So I want it to start off screen. I want it to be on screen for a little bit. And then I want it to go off screen again. So I'm going to animate the position of this rectangle. So I can either animate it under the rectangle transform controls, or I can animate it under the layer transform controls. I'm going to animate it under the rectangle transform controls. So I'm going to do an intro of the way, just uh, leave them in the chat. And wh when I see them, I can answer them. I'm going to go back to the beginning and then move it off. If I hold down shift, I can move it off all in, in one go. And then that way it looks like this. Now this is a very, you know, very easy. Let's see ease in. Yeah, that looks nice. So it starts a little bit faster and then it, it ends up a little bit slower. And then I'll keep it on screen until the end, at which point I will add another position keyframe. I'll go to the end here and now I will move it off entirely like that. So this is what the animation now looks like. It comes in, it stays on, and then it comes off. It comes in, it stays on, and then it comes off. That is my transition, but it is only one layer thus far. So what I have to do is duplicate the shape layer a couple of times. So I'm going to select it, Command C to copy, Command V to paste, and I'll paste it twice. So there we go. Now there's three on top of each other. The second one, I'll move it down again by holding Shift and then the third one, I'll move it down again by holding shift. So now they're a little bit overlaid. They're all red, which is fine for now. If you want to differentiate them, you can go into the fill uh, controls of the rectangle here under fill, and you can change the fill color. So let's just make it very obvious that they're different with some ugly colors like green and well, green and red makes me think of Christmas. I almost never use green and red in my designs because it's always associated with Christmas with, for people. And then I'll use a blue. Hashi, if you're watching, I'm sorry that you can't see these colors. <laughs> but they're all going at the same time, right? So I want to stagger in this uh, view. I'm just going to move the beginning keyframe and this keyframe over a little bit. 
and the ending keyframes, I will move them in a little bit. So now we have the red and then the green, and then the red comes off first, and then, oop, actually, let's have the red come off first. So the red's keyframes should be, and I can also, I can change the, the colors of these layers. So I can do this bottom one is red, this one is green, and then the this one is blue, so you can see it better. So I'll change the red one's keyframes over a little bit so that the red one disappear the same, but I move them in a way that, you know, they are uh, a little bit in front of the green. Okay, so it starts, the green is a little bit behind the red, and then there we go. And then we'll do the same thing with the blue one. So we'll have the blue one's keyframes start a little bit later. So something like that. And then the blue one's keyframes here at the end should start um, somewhere like that. I'll adjust the green ones a little bit just so they're, they're in a row and I'll adjust the red ones a little bit as well. So now it looks like this. I made it funky colors so that you can tell how I'm gonna change it later, but this is our transition that we're gonna use to transition from one Premiere Pro clip to another by overlaying it on top. So now that I have this, let me see where that transition ends. That transition ends like there. So I will just add a quick marker or maybe not. Okay, that's fine. I know that it's at 19 seconds and then it's at 19 frames and this one's at 308. So before I go ahead and start um, doing the responsive time, I want to show you how to actually make this into a template. So I'll go to window and I'll go to essential graphics and that pulls up my essential graphics window and I'll go ahead and select the composition that I was working on, which is called try line transition. Now there's nothing in here yet, but we will put things in here so that we can then uh, have properties that are editable in Premiere Pro. So the first thing I'm going to do is make a null layer. Now a null layer is just a container for expressions or something that can move something else. Think of a null layer as, think of your layers as like a marionette's hands. So you have like one layer, you have another layer, you have like a foot, and then the null object is like the person controlling the marionette puppet, right? I'll not go on until the stream is back. Okay, I think the stream is back. So if you can see me, can you comment Christmas on the chat? And then that way I know that you can see me. The stream was down, but if you comment Christmas, I will be right back. Okay. It looks like I got a Christmas. Cool. So I'm going to add in the layer so that I can create that puppeteer that's going to puppet these layers. So I'm going to go to layer, new, null, object. And there it is. It has appeared. It's actually nothing. So I can just uh, disable the visibility so it doesn't do anything for me. And I can go ahead and rename it. So I'm going to go to rename and I'm going to call it expression controls. So this is our puppeteer, right? Ex the expression controls null object. And I'm going to lock it. Oh, hello, hello. I'm going to lock it up here in the ex effect controls window. I'm going to press the lock button, which I can't zoom in on for some reason, but I'm going to lock it. So now I'll go into my effects and presets and I'll type in color control because that's the one that I want color control and I want three of them right because I want three different color controls and I'll just drag it onto the expression controls null layer so now I have the three color controls I'll go ahead and open them up so color control one two three and here are those color controls and I can rename them for my benefit here so I'll go ahead and rename and I'll say uh, line one color rename line two color and then I'll rename this one line three color so just for myself to know and now that they're locked up here what I can do is I can go into the fill properties so line one was this one red right so I'll go into the fill properties of that rectangle 
And I will pick whip, which is this little, um, it kind of looks like the Tafiti symbol from Moana, but it's called a pick whip. And I will pick whip the line one color. And guess what? They're all going to turn back to red again. I'm going to go to the second one here, uh, contents, rectangle, fill. I'm going to pick whip that color to line two color. And the same thing again here. I'm going to pick whip the, um, the fill color to this new color. So they're all red, obviously, because that is uh, what I've chosen here. But then here, I can now adjust them to whatever I need them to be. And it also adjusts the ones in the actual template. So now they're here, but we haven't created the template yet. We have just created the null object. So how do you create the template? Well, you go ahead and you just open up the color options under the expression controls here and you simply drag these little color uh, words icons into your essential graphics window so line one color i'll drag that in line two color i'll drag that in and line three color i'll drag that in and of course they're all called color so i have to rename them again so i'll do line one color and it is common for you to do this in all caps that is like the the thing to do line three color there we go and now i have it almost done the only thing left is i need a thumbnail which is done with the set poster frame so i'll just click set poster frame but it's the wrong thumbnail right they're coming in but my my uh current time indicator is right here my playhead so maybe i want my playhead to be like here and then I click set poster time. So you can kind of see a little bit of a thumbnail of what this is going to look like. And I'm going to call it try line transition. I'll call it try line transition one because we're not done. We have. I am just waiting for the stream to get back up again before I, I think it's back up. Okay. So uh, then you can choose whether to save it to your local drive or you can save it to your libraries if you want. Um, I'm going to save it to my library so it just shows up in Premiere when I open it and I could add some key. I'm not going to do that yet because this is not the final version. I just want to show you what it looks like without the responsive design and I'm going to press OK. Now my Premiere has crashed so I need to reopen it. So just give me a quick sec to do that before we get into it. OK. Uh, no, that wasn't the one. That wasn't the one. Um, let me know in the chat room if you, this is something that you've seen before, this pro this process, or if this is new for you. Because um, I feel like for a lot of people, this is a new process that hasn't been really discussed before at length, which is why I'm so happy to bring it to you right now. Okay, I'm opening the project. It's happening. I'm opening the project in Premiere. It's almost there. Yes, thank you. Okay, there we, there we go. Okay, so here I am. It has added that try line transition effect to my library. So now if I want to transition, let's say I want to transition between this shot right here and then the next shot right here, I'll just drag that try line transition over it. And there we go. There's that transition. It's not exactly the right colors quite yet. So I can go ahead and maybe have some of it over like this so that I can see what the colors are, select it. And now the color picker is here in Essential Graphics in the edit window. So I can go ahead and use the color pickers to pick the exact colors from, or it should be working. Maybe I'll have to do it like this. Of course, it should work. I don't know why every time I have to do a demo, it it doesn't, but it worked like 300 times earlier. But yeah, usually you can just pick the colors from here and it should be fine. So that's cool and all, but you see what happens is that it can only ever be the four seconds that I set it as because it has these end caps on the on the clip right here. 
the little little triangles, right? Which means if I wanted to make it shorter, if I wanted to just make it like, if I wanted to make this section in the middle where they're covering up the entire screen, just a frame long, for example, I can't do that. Because if I shorten it, it literally, it works like a clip, right? So it just shortens it like a clip, like that. And if I, so what I would have to do is I would have to like go through here, then cut it, command K, then go to the end where it ends, then cut it, then cut out this middle part, then put them together like this, because it, it acts as a clip. It's not dynamic quite yet. That's what I want it to look like, but I want it to be able to do that dynamically. So how do you add that dynamic responsive design? Well, it's very simple. So now that we have this all book area to this um, to this section. Oh, we are, the stream is down again. Okay, we are back. Um, okay, hopefully you can see it. Yes, you can see it. What is the last thing you heard before the stream went down? Okay, I think you can see it. So now we're gonna trim our work area to just this section by just pressing N, which will stands for end, right? So our work area is trimmed here. And we're gonna right click in the area where our work area Okay, hopefully the stream is down or back up. Let's see, let's see, let's see. The last thing I showed you was um, how to trim that work area by pressing N for end. Let's see. Live streaming is stressful, y'all. Okay, there we go. We're back up. So we trimmed this uh, section to our work area, or we trimmed our work area to just the intro section, and then click and go to create protected region from work area. So we're going to protect that so that it can't... It's down again. Oh my gosh. Thanks, y'all. We're going to protect that so that it can't um, be stretched, meaning to end. And then we will do right click, create protect. Okay, and we're back. So, what I was saying was um, let me redo that last bit again. So, I also want to create a protected region at the end here where the transition ends. So, I'm going to press uh, B and that will trim my work area. So if my work area was here and I press B, that'll trim my work area to just the end section. And and then I will right click and go to create protected region from work area. And now I have responsive design on, right? So now if I go to my essential graphics window, I'll do transit try line transition two so you can see the difference and then i'll go to export motion graphics template it's asking me to save it first yes save thank you and then in my library please put in my library and then i'll put some keywords so i'll say transition transparency three lines graphic um color picker yeah i'll add those keywords and i'll say okay and it's going to automatically show up in Premiere for me. So if I go to the Browse tab, here it is, the Transition 2. So now I'm going to drag it on top here. And now it is fully responsive. So if I wanted to make it shorter, uh, all I have to do is drag it and make it shorter. And those, those animations are still retained, but the middle part is squeezed. Cool, right? Was that cool? Nikisha says that I'm a saint, that I'm patient. She would be a blubbering snot. <laughs> she would be a pile of frustration. Well, thanks, Nikisha. And hopefully, uh, let's see if the color picker works. It, it, I swear, when I tried this earlier, it worked. Some, sometimes when it's on a live stream, it decides that it doesn't want to do anything. That's fine. Usually the color picker will work for you. But anyway, that is the transition for that and the color picker and the different colors should work. So say you wanted to do crazy colors for some unknown god awful reason, you could always um, 
you know, make your dreams come true with the crazy colors if you want it to. So that is how you do that um, particular transition with the colors. I was going to show you um, how to do a, how to, how to also modify and use uh, rotation controls, add rotation controls, point controls, and stuff like that. If you want to know it, if you want to stick around, um, let me know in the chat room. I don't want to take up too much of your day. And I know that a lot of these internet problems have been messing me up today. So if you want to see that, I would be more than happy to stick around and show you, but it's up to you and your schedule. Because Yes, it looks like they are here. You are here and you can live with the lag. Thank you. Okay, so let me show you one more thing then. All right, so what if you have a PNG element that you want to turn into a sticker, right? And you want it to put it on your videos. You want to animate it and then you want to have it as something that can be customizable, right? Looks like people are here to stay. Okay, great. So let's take a look. Um, what I have here is one sec. Let me make sure everything's up. Okay. So what I have here is an arrow PNG that I drew in, uh, in Illustrator. You can't see it because it's white on white here, but it looks like this. It's an arrow PNG. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just drag it directly into my project window here. And hopefully after I drag it, you can finally see what it actually looks like. So there it is, an arrow PNG. So what I want to do is animate this arrow going from left to right like that, right? And then I also want to give the viewer the ability to place this arrow anywhere on the screen and to rotate it however they want on the screen. So for that, I'm going to use point controls and I'm going to use slider controls. And of course, I also want to give them the opportunity to change the color of the arrow. The stream is down. One. <sighs> Next time the stream goes down, I should make a funny face so that that's what you're staring at while it's down. So last time we went composition, new composition. This time, let's just go to the new composition button because uh, it's the same thing. And then we'll title this composition um, Growing Arrow. And there we go. And then we could just drag that arrow PNG over here. So one thing about this arrow PNG is we have our anchor point smack dab in the middle right here of the layer. So if we wanted to do a rotation um, sort of vibe and we went to the transform controls and we played with the rotation, what happens is it rotates about that center point, about that um, anchor point, and we don't want that. We want it to rotate kind of in a circle like this. So we're going to move the anchor point to the middle of that circle, if that makes sense, right? So imagine that arrow was in a circle. We're going to move the anchor point to the middle of the circle. Uh, take that anchor point and uh, use that rotation to kind of make sure that it is still on the screen and it looks like it's rotating around the anchor point. Cool. Let's move the position a little bit up. Oh, nope. That's not what I meant to do. So there we go. Now it's rotating kind of, it's a little big, but it is rotating about the screen. Let's move it down a little bit so it fits on the screen. Yeah. Okay. So there we go. So I've moved that anchor point so that it can rotate freely and I'll go put the rotation back at zero. Um, the next thing that I would like to do, and that's basically all for that. The next thing is we need to make it look like it is writing on the screen from left to right, that it is kind of like appearing from left to right. So we're going to use the stroke effect. So here up here in effects and presets, we're going to type in stroke and then drop the stroke effect directly onto that arrow. Oh, before we do that, actually, we have to draw the actual path. So we're going to go to the pen tool and draw the path first before we add the stroke. I skipped a step. So we'll click the pen tool. We'll draw that path that we want the stroke to follow. There we go. So we want the stroke to go from here to here. 
and then we'll add the stroke effect on top of it. So now we have a couple of options. The first thing is we want our paint style to reveal the original image. There it is. And then right now it's kind of feathered. So let's see if I take down the brush size, you can see that the, the brush by default is feathered. So we're going to just increase the brush hardness to 100%. And there we go. Now we reveal the whole arrow. Of course, there's no animation yet. You animate using the end point keyframe. So we're going to go to where we want the arrow to start animating, which is one frame in. This is important. You want the arrow to start animating one frame in. We're going to add a keyframe and we're going to make that end zero. Then we're going to go to where we want the arrow to finish animating, kind of here, and we're going to take that endpoint and write in 100. So now you can see that it kind of goes from 0 to 100, but it goes in these like rough steps, you can see, step, 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 step. So in order to make that smoother, we are going to uh, change the spacing of it. So we're going to, if you increase the spacing, it'll be even worse. So you have to decrease the spacing so that it's smooth in this case, right? So now we have added, we have changed that anchor point. So our rotation. Okay, this stream is back up. I just want to know, did you see me add that? Um, change the spacing in the stream before we blipped out of the simulation or did you not see me change the spacing let me know and i can redo that basically all i did was in i changed the number for spacing and i took it to zero and that means that it draws on a lot smoother instead of in those rough steps this as well so i'll do like an easy smoother sure Yeah. Okay. So now that we have this arrow, let's build our um, null object just like we did before. So we're going to, the, I mean, the last time we had uh, three different, uh, three different layers. This time we just have the one layer, but we're going to add a new one. So we're going to add new null object and we're going to hide it again. And we're going to rename it expand controls just like we did last time. And now we're going to add a bunch of expression controls to it. Okay, so I'm going to add the color control. Uh, actually, I'm going to add I'm going to add fill to this arrow first. I'm going to add the fill effect so that we can actually have color on it. So I'm going to add the fill effect, and that'll make it red. But that'll give us a color picker. Okay, so I added a fill to this uh, arrow so that I could actually have the ability to then have a color picker. I added a color control to the air to the expression controls null object just like we did last time. So here it is in effects. I'm going to add a point control effect as well, and I'm going to go and add a slider control again as well, but I'm going to do it twice. So underneath. Here we have our color control, point control, slider control, and another slider control. I know what the color control and the point control are for the slider controls. I'll rename them just so that I know what they are. One of them is going to be um, rotation, and then the other one is going to be scale. Okay, so now that we have all that, uh, we can lock those effect controls up here so that we can pick whip to them more easily. So for the color control, that's easy, right? We will go to our, the, the effect that we just added, which is the fill effect. And here the fill effect does have a color property. So we can go ahead and just pick whip that color property to the color control. So now whatever, you know, whatever we choose to be the color up here is now the color of the arrow, just like before. Now for the point control, we are going to go to the transform controls for position and we're going to pick whip it to the point control. So of course it moved it to 50 pixels by 50 pixels and we have to move it back. So what was it before? It was 
960 by 516, that's what we'll move it back to. We'll move it back to 960 by 516, just like it was. For the rotation, we can also pick whip to the slider here. So this is just a slider and it's gonna be able to give us our rotation controls. And then for the scale, we can also pick whip the scale over here. Right now the scale is set at zero. We will set it back to 100 and there it is. So now we have all of our controls, our color control, point control, rotation control, and now we're gonna build that template. So we're gonna to go to window, Ascent, oh, not that, not info, window, essential graphics, and then pull it up here. So growing arrow was the one that we were looking at, growing arrow, it currently doesn't have anything in it. So we'll go to expression controls. The first thing we'll do is color control. So we'll drop that in and we'll just call it color. We'll go to point control, drop that in, we'll call it position. So these are, this is what the person in the template is gonna be able to see. The rotation controls, we'll drag that slider in, we'll call it rotation. Now here on the edit range, this is very important here because uh, if I leave this open-ended, a person can just go from, it, it'll just go from one to a hundred. So it'll only give me this much range of motion in the default slider because the default slider goes one to 100. So we have to click edit range in order to give it the ability to go from zero to 360. So it has the full range of motion. So we'll go click edit range and we'll take the slider range from zero to 360. So it has full range of motion for that arrow. So now the slider has expanded. So we have that full range of motion. And then we'll put in the scale property as well and we'll call it scale. And for this one, we want it to max out at 100. So actually our slider is perfect because if we edited the range, for example, one to 400, and then gave the person the ability to increase it to 400, it would actually take the arrow off of our work area. And we don't want that. We want the maximum size of the arrow to be 100. So we will leave that be at 100. So they can always make the arrow smaller, but they cannot make the arrow larger because at that point it would go off of screen. Okay, does that make sense? So we'll put a default color on it as white. We'll set the poster time. Whoop. We'll set the poster time and we will add a name. So we'll call it um, growing arrow. But hey, guess what? Just like before, this arrow is going to animate on exactly at the speed every single time you put it in, right? So let's just say growing arrow one, let's just save it as that, export motion graphics template, save, save it to libraries, and we're gonna call it growing arrow one, just so we can see what it looks like. So we're gonna go back to our Premiere project and back to browse, and here's growing arrow one, let's put it in. So here it is, right? But it's only ever gonna grow at this rate and of course we can go ahead and we can change the colors of it if we want we can change the rotation so we can like maybe point at her face we can make it smaller we can move it over using the position controls now something like that but it's only ever going to grow at this rate so how do we do the opposite of the responsive design that we did earlier how do we make the animation change speeds and not um, anything else. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go back and remember how I said you have to start your animation one frame in. That is very important. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to take our work area and we're going to trim it to just one frame and we're going to press N right after the animation ends as well. So the animation ends here. So we're going to press B. Uh, I'm just going to let's expand that work area. Oh, I was pressing N instead. Oh, my finger was on the wrong button. So right where the animation ends, we're going to press B. So now everything after the arrow grows, we're going to protect that too. Create protected region from work area. So now the arrow itself will be the thing that is the animation of the arrow will be the thing that we can now manipulate and grow. Let's adjust this a little bit. Take that work area, move it back across the whole thing. And then create motion graphics template. Oh, actually, 
let's just call it growing arrow two so you can see the difference create motion graphics template save it save it to library let's add some words so arrow um color picker position controls um small graphic element i don't know i'll just press okay oh opacity yeah and press okay so now i'll go back into premiere and it is here in my browse window so i can inside of essential graphics so i can just drop it in and now take a look okay so this is the default duration but if i scooch it over it should go well well that is a lot faster but here it is going a lot faster here it is going even faster and then it it ends on just being on screen so now i can go ahead and you know rotate it change the size of it move it about whatever i need it to be maybe make it like a light blue or a, a bright yellow whatever my you know whatever my brand colors are for whatever that is and i can change the the speed of the animation i would like to th okay uh, okay i'm back okay um i think we did it <laughs> i might have this might have been a little bit uh too complicated i'm not sure i tried to make it as as intuitive as possible however if you are having issues you can always go to adobe.ly slash tips tuesday and you can download the manual which i wrote every every step that i just covered with you i wrote adobe.ly slash tips tuesday for that Anyway, so thank you so much for being here with me today. And join us next week if you thought that this was interesting. Next week, we are going to build on the learning from this week because I didn't even get into text. How do you make a text template? How do you give people the options to edit font, to edit size, to edit the size of text boxes be behind font? How do you make text boxes grow with your font input or with your font size? This is a little bit more complicated because now we're getting into text, but I feel like we can do it. So definitely if you are a homie, give me a fist bump emoji because you survived. We survived the technical issues. We're done for today. Please, please, please come back next week because if you learned this today, you're going to be way ahead next week when we talk about how to create motion graphics with text. Until then, have a lovely rest of your day and I'll see you on the internet.